Good morning, church. It's good to be with you again. Trust that you've been walking in the grace and the peace of God. The Word of God teaches us that through all of these things, we are more than conquerors. And one scripture I love is that scripture that declares God's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is the kingdom of God. So I trust that your homes are filled with the righteousness of God, the peace of God, and the joy of God in the Spirit of God. This morning I want to speak to you about the behavior of humanity in relation to God. And as we go through this study, this word this morning, we will see that there are patterns that reoccur all the way from the Old Testament right up until the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. And we'll also see that God's dealings with humanity are repeated over and over again. And I want to speak about these things in the context of the time that we find ourselves in today. So let's go into the Old Testament and we'll begin to look at the children of Israel and the great exodus, the great deliverance that God worked on their behalf. When you go back to that time, you see that the people of God were in bondage, they were in slavery, and God came down from heaven. And on their behalf, he manifested his power, his glory, his strength, his might to set his people free. And those Israelites, they saw the most incredible miracles. There was one plague after another, and finally the 10th plague was completed. And then God led them out, and he led them to the Red Sea. And right there before their eyes, the God of heaven, our creator, opened that sea before them. And he took them through that Red Sea out of bondage into the wilderness to bring them into the promised land. God's purpose in this was not just to deliver them, but he wanted to have a nation for himself. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. God had a plan and a purpose for it. And we see at one stage that the Israelites are rejoicing in this great deliverance. They're praising God. But as you go just a little time forward, you find that when Moses was up on the mount, that already the people of Israel turn their backs on God. They make themselves a golden calf. They begin to act in a way of immorality, indulging the flesh, partying, and they, they literally rejected God who brought them out of Egypt, and they started attributing that deliverance to a false God. Isn't it incredible to think that you can see God demonstrate his grace, his love, and his power in your life, and then a short while later turn your back on God. And this is a pattern that we see time and time again through the Old Testament. When we come over to the Tower of Babel, which was obviously before the Exodus, again we see humanity there. They've come from the other side of the flood, and they are building this great tower because in their minds and in their hearts, this is what they're saying. They're saying that we will not be subject to God. We will be masters and commander of our own destiny. And the purpose behind building that tower was to say that we will look after ourselves, we will keep ourselves safe, and they were denying God's sovereignty over their life. And I want to tell you that's a pattern that seemed time and time again throughout all of history. And later on, I'll be applying that to what we see in this day and age. Another example I want to take you to is the book of Judges. This is an incredible book that's almost like a blueprint for the rest of the Old Testament. And as you read the book of Judges, this is after Joshua has died. He's um, gone into Sheol. He's left the people of Israel. And the word of God says that the, the people of Israel did evil in the sight of God. They did evil in the sight of God. They've come into the promised land. They've inherited God's promises, God's goodness, and now we find them doing evil in the sight of God. And the word of God goes on to say that God basically gave them over to the enemy. He sent the enemy in to conquer them. And when you read that, you think, why would God do that to his people? And one of the things that we've got to understand in life, the reality of life is this, that the most important thing in life is your relationship and my relationship with our Creator. 
Everything else comes secondary. Nothing else compares. And these people have fallen out of relationship with God. They're doing evil in God's sight. And so he delivers them over to the enemies. And as time goes on and God sees their cries, he raises up a deliverer. He raises up a judge who comes in and through the anointing of God on their life sees the people of God set free. So no longer they have been oppressed, no longer they in bondage. They are now living in freedom. And what op- hap- so often happens is that when we are blessed of God and we come into a good place and a place of freedom and blessing, we see time and again how humanity then forgets about God, turns their back on God and begins to do evil again. So these judges came in, they overthrew the enemy, they saw the people of Israel delivered. And the word of God says that when that judge died, that deliverer died, that the people again did evil in the sight of God. And as you read through that book of Judges, 12 times this happened. So this is obviously over generations. 12 times God had to raise up deliverers to set his people free because they had fallen back into sin. And, and the word of God says that each generation did more evil than the generation before them. When we look at this and we see this pattern happening, we have to ask ourselves a question. Surely, why would God continually raise up deliverers for these people? You know, when you read it sometimes, you, you can almost sit there and think, God, why didn't you just give up on them? But the good news is this, that God is a God of love, he's a God of grace, and he has a purpose through everything that we go through in life to reconcile us to himself, for us to get our lives right with him, and for our lives to bring him glory so that we can go into glory and be with him in eternity. As we look at those people in the Old Testament, I've heard different people say, you know, how frustrating it is to read. And you, you think, why doesn't God just give up on them? But I want to tell you, it's no different today. When you look at the globe today, globally, I think we can say with an assurance that we, humanity, have turned our backs on God. Let me say that again. Humanity, today in the 21st century, we have turned our backs on God. And that's a sobering thing to say. There are whole nations who deny the very existence of God. Whole nations, communists, who don't believe in the existence of God. You have whole nations who have rejected the true one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and they would rather worship false gods. They would rather worship devils and demons, and they have turned their back on God. And even when we come to other countries that may not have given themselves over to false religions or communism, we see that, uh, and probably more so in the Western nations or those nations that have been influenced by the West, that we have raised up many towers of Babel. What do I mean by that? When we look at the United Nations, when we look at the World, uh, sorry, the World Health Organization, European Union, One World Initiatives, Climate Change, All of these things are like little towers of Babel and they are there built up by man to say, God, we don't acknowledge you. We don't acknowledge your sovereignty. We don't believe that we have to keep your word to be blessed. We're going to do it our way. And when we reap the consequences, we will find a solution for it. It was the same in the the days of the the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament. It's the same spirit manifesting. Ultimately, we're saying we are masters and commander of our own destiny. And as I say these things, you might be thinking, why are you talking like this today? And the reason I am is because I believe that what we are facing today, what we're going through as a globe, um, as nations around the world, that I believe there's great significance that God has a purpose in what's happening. When we look at humanity today and how humanity has rebelled against God's natural order, we see so much sexual immorality. We see perverseness in that whole arena. We see how humanity has not only come against God's natural order, but against his creative order. In the book of Genesis, the word of God says, male and female made he them. But yet today we see humanity rising up and saying, no, we can choose what we want to be. We have the science, we have the power, we have the ability to do what we want. And we don't realize as these things are happening, 
but it's actually humanity lifting up their fist against God and saying, God, we will not follow your ways. We will not follow your order. We want to do it our way. When you look at the sanctity of life, um, I believe one of the statistics that I was looking at, they say that 56 million babies are aborted every year. When you look at these figures, it's astounding, and it ought to shock us as the church. But not only that, we see in the professing church compromise, even embracing that which God calls sin in our midst. What a horrendous thing that is. There are things nowadays that the professing church will say, it's okay, we embrace it, God is a God of love, and yet God's word says, no, this is sin. We need to repent from it. So often what we've seen in this 21st century is man bringing God down. And I'm talking about the professing church here, bringing God down to a God of our own thinking, a God who is manageable to us, a God with whom we are comfortable with in relation to our values and our feelings. And I want to tell you today that we do not have the right to bring God down and subject him to our values, our emotions, our feelings. We are the ones that have to humble ourselves before God, get on our knees before him and acknowledge him as God, as creator, as sovereign over our lives. One of the things that you often hear in the church today, along the lines of this compromise and accepting things that God calls sin as being okay, is when you hear people speak about the love of God or the grace of God, One of the things I can say about God's love and God's grace, it goes beyond our comprehension. It goes beyond our understanding. There is nothing greater than the love of God for you and I. There is nothing greater than the grace of God for you and I. It's the very reason that we have salvation. But I want to tell you that love, that grace, should never be cheapened where we use it as an excuse to cover up the things that God himself calls us to repent from. The beautiful thing about grace is this, that it comes into our life to break the power of sin. It comes into our life to convict us, to bring us to a place of repentance so that we get our lives right with God. God's love and grace is not there to comfort us while we continue in rebellion against him. I believe that all of these things that I'm talking about on this video today are things that are a reality on this world today, are a reality in the generation that we live in. And I believe that what we're walking through today is a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for us to begin to lift our eyes away from ourselves about our needs, our wants, our frustrations, our challenges, and to actually step back and say, God, what are you saying? What are you doing at this time? God's word says that we are not to despise his goodness and his mercy. He says this in relation to the fact that his goodness and his mercy are poured out on us in order to lead us to repentance. That's a powerful thing. That's something that we have to get hold of as the church. We can't go through life claiming God's goodness, his grace, and his mercy, and his love, while we continue on in sin. God says, don't despise my goodness. It is there to lead you and I to repentance. And what a glorious thing that is when God grants his people repentance, because it is there that we can get our lives right with God. I want you for a moment to consider the cry that must have come up from Sodom and Gomorrah when God looked down at Sodom and Gomorrah and he saw what was going on there. Those two little cities in relation to cities today were such small cities. And yet when God looked down and saw that immorality, that perverseness, it was so obnoxious to him that he poured out judgment, fire and brimstone on those two cities and destroyed them. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. They don't like to talk about that. And then they say things like, that's the God of the Old Testament. I want to tell you the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament, is the same God of eternity. He is the Lord and he changes not. And I was reflecting on this and thinking, Lord, if those two small cities and the magnitude of their sin in relation to what we see on the the globe today, there's no comparison Uh, when you compare the magnitude of it. And if God saw that in Sodom and Gomorrah, the question that I ask is, God, what are you seeing 
as you look down upon your creation today in the 21st century. And as we begin to contemplate this and reflect on it, I believe as the church, we need to look at things from God's perspective. We've got to look at things from God's perspective and get in our lives right with him. One of the things that I wanted to say to us this morning is this, that Jesus is coming back soon. The Son of God is coming back to this earth. That's something that we need to get into our spirits. You know, so often as Christians we say, yes, we believe this, but we need to live in the reality of it. We live our lives as if God is not coming back. We live our lives as if the only thing that matters is this life on this planet. This life only matters to the extent that we get our lives into right relationship with God and we realize we are pilgrims passing through and that we are here for God's glory and for his pleasure. So with that in mind, let us read Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Verse 39, And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That scripture to me is one an incredibly sobering scripture when we contemplate the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus is there and he's speaking and he's teaching us that when he comes back to this earth, that in effect people will not be expecting it, that people will be caught unawares, that people will be like they were in the days of Noah, where they carried on indulging their fleshly appetites, living for self, and they only woke up to the judgment and the wrath of God when it was being poured out upon them. And so it's going to be when Jesus comes again. Do you know, it's probably important at a time like this where we encourage people and we're concerned about their well-being. But, you know, the more I begin to think about this, I thought, Lord, the greatest thing that we should be concerned about is the eternal well-being of souls. And I believe that we're living in a time where we are getting closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 24, verse 42, Jesus says, Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord will come. In verse 44, he says again, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Jesus is actually telling you and I that he will come when we think he's not coming. The Word of God says that that day will come as a thief in the night. Jesus won't come as a thief, but that day will come as a thief. It will come unexpected. And this is what I believe that we need to be aware of as Christians and as those that are reaching out to the lost, that in the days of Noah, they were so consumed with their daily lives. You think of life before the restrictions that came in. Our lives were filled with so much and so many things that we have been so distracted. There's probably hardly a moment of the day where we're not busy with something and that we're not busy with work or with family. We're busy with online um, different uh, uh, devices and apps that we get on. Our lives are being so consumed. And Jesus said, that's what it's going to be like, that you will be so distracted and so caught up with everyday life that you don't realize that I am about to return. And church When we see things like we're seeing today, it should awaken us. It should alert us. We shouldn't just be saying, what's going on? What's the government doing? And getting worried about what's happening in the natural realm. We should be taking a step back and say, God, what are you saying? What are you doing at this time? We are exalted by Jesus to be spiritually alert, to be spiritually awake, active, ready. Why would Jesus warn us of those things? If he's coming back again, Why doesn't he just say, look forward to it, I'll be there one day? He didn't warn people when he came the first time as a babe in a manger. Let's read at Revelation chapter 6. And the word of God says, uh, starting at verse 12 there in chapter 6, And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, 
And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman and every free man hid themselves, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And then they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? What an incredible word that is. These men, these people on this planet that are going to be here when Jesus returns again and they don't know him as their Lord and Savior will actually be crying out in fear. They would rather have mountains and rocks fall on them to hide them from the wrath of Jesus Christ who's coming back to this earth. That is such a sobering thing. That day is coming. Jesus is coming back in glory, majesty, and power. Scripture reveals that there will be wars, that there will be famines, that there will be pestilence, which means diseases, preceding his return. And I want to say today that we're in the middle of one of those pestilences. And what does this mean for us? When you look throughout Scripture, we learn that God uses these troubles to judge, to warn, to wake up his people, to cause his people to turn back to him. One of the scriptures that we all love so much in the second book of Chronicles is a scripture that says, If my people who are called by my name should humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, pray, God says, I will hear. But you know, the verses before that, they say something very interesting. Verse 13, it says, If I shut up heaven, this is God speaking, that there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people. Can you imagine? God is saying that I will bring drought, I will bring the plague, I will bring the pestilence, the disease, we would say today the pandemic, to get my people to humble themselves, to get my people to pray, to get my people to turn from their wicked ways. I want to say again, he's the same God of the New Testament as he is of the Old Testament. God is in the business of getting us into a right relationship with him because this life on this earth is only a pilgrimage and God is concerned with your eternity and my eternity. So the word of God teaches that God is the one that poured these things out to get his people to turn back to him, his people. In the book of Revelation, we see the same thing. It is God who's pouring out plagues upon the earth before the return of Jesus Christ. And I just want to pick it up in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. And the rest of the men who were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. You can read that in your own time. Revelation chapter 9 is describing how God pours out these plagues and so many people are killed. And yet God says in the midst of that, the people who are still alive would not repent. We've got to understand that God uses. Sometimes he's the one that initiates it. Sometimes he's the one that actually sends it. But even in cases where he allows it, God is allowing it to get your attention, to get my attention, to wake up to the fact that we need to turn back to him, that we need to get ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is so huge. This is, this is all about our eternity. And these things we should not just dismiss to the side, but we've got to get hold of them and say, yes, God, I will respond to what's happening at this time, not by worrying, not by fear, not by chasing this theory and that theory, but by getting on my knees and turning back to you. Very quickly, I want to consider the 20th century. In World War I, 20 million deaths. World War II, 75 million deaths. The Spanish flu, 20 to 50 million deaths. Flu pandemic of 68, the Asian flu of 56, HIV, AIDS, 
All of these things, 1 million deaths, 2 million deaths, 36 million deaths. And I read a, a, a documentary where they said there was 26 million documented martyrs in the 20th century alone. These figures, they're, ap- uh, they're, they're like um, apocalyptic figures. They should be so astounding to us that they wake us up. I believe it's true to say that we are living in the end times. And if these things that God used on a smaller scale in the Old Testament to turn his people back to him, how much more should it be grabbing our attention today to realize that we are living in the last days? Creation is indeed groaning. There is so much going on, and yet it's so easy for us to carry on with business as usual. As the church, carrying on with business as usual, I believe we need to stop. We need to turn back to God. We need to humble ourselves. We need to seek his face. Jesus is coming back again soon. Hallelujah. I just want to close by sharing three words that God gave to me on New Year's Eve 2019. We were here in prayer and God just laid on my heart and it was so strong. Three words, turn to God. And, and as I received those words and I was praying, I actually spoke them out in the prayer time that we had here at church. But my mind was trying to understand what God are you saying? We're all supposed to turn to you. And I had a sense. I had no a sense or understanding of what we're facing at the moment. I just had a sense that something would happen in 2020 where we would need to turn to God. And as I was speaking out, I was my mind at the same time was saying, we all need to turn to God. People are facing challenges now. But now that I look at it in hindsight, I realize that God was giving me those three words as a response to this pandemic, which was about to come over the globe. And I want to encourage you today, turn to God. Now, there's different ways we can turn to God. You know, if somebody loses their job, they turn to God and they pray. They pray for a job and they get their job and very quickly we turn back to what we were doing. Very quickly we turn away. I believe that God wasn't just saying, turn to me to get through this trouble. Turn to me just so that uh, you can have provision or blessing. I believe that God was saying, turn with your whole life, your whole life, every part of our being. We need to turn to God. So often we just turn to God to get us out of the trouble like the people did in the book of Judges. And when the deliverer delivers us, we go back to life as usual. I believe God is saying that we need to turn to him and yield and give him our whole life. Jesus said that if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. It is imperative that we understand that what is happening in the world today above everything else, should bring us to a place where we turn to God with our whole being, with all of our strength, with all of our might, that we put God back in the place of preeminence. We sing the song, Jesus be at the center, then we go and live our lives and forget about him until we come back to the church service the next week. We need to have lives like Paul the Apostle who said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I believe so strongly, church, that what we are going through at the moment uh, is a part of the signs of the time. It is a sign of the soon return of Jesus Christ. And it's also God in his grace and in his love allowing these things to happen to wake us up, to cause us to look to him and go to him for salvation and for deliverance. I want to encourage you as this video comes to an end, that you go through this week and you begin to pray and say, God, let me hear your voice. Let me understand what you're saying to me and give me the grace to turn to you at this time. Church, God bless you. Trust you have a great week in God and seek him and put him first in your lives. God bless.